All right. So there's a podium here, and I can't stand there. I don't need that. Um, so uh, this conference has been really um, enlightening for me. One of the common themes that I've had throughout this conference is I run into people, and they say, dude, we've seen you on YouTube, and I feel like I know you. And um, they talk about how much they've learned from watching some of the webinars that we have on LearnChef.com. I've had people come up to me and say that we bootstrap our new employees by telling them, go look at LearnChef.com and then come back and see me in six hours. And now we're going to talk about Chef. We think that that's really awesome and super important. It's also a great way for us as a community to grow our community and to bring more people into our community. So I'm happy this morning to announce a new initiative that we're going to launch. This is, uh, like all things that we do, it's an experiment. We're going to try this thing, and I think it's going to be really good, but we're going to learn a lot as we do it. We're calling this thing the Chef's Table. The idea here is that we will allow you to join this program, the Chef's Table. We're going to invite you into the kitchen. You'll be able to meet with the masters, the folks that are using Chef, the folks that are building Chef. You'll be able to ask questions in online office hours format style. You'll be able to go to free training classes. You'll get early access to video tutorials and so forth that we have. You can learn a little bit more about this beta program that we're launching right now at getchef.com slash table. I definitely encourage you to check it out. You can help us learn how to help more of us learn Chef and be more awesome at Chef. For our final keynote this morning before we break for lunch, I'd like to bring up Rachel Chalmers from Ignition Partners. <clears throat> The lectern is for me. My name's Rachel, and I'm very lazy. People always laugh when I say that, but it's absolutely true. Um, it's how I got interested in automation in the first place. I was a journalist and an IT analyst for 15 years, and um, actually got to cover some of these companies, Blade Logic and Opsquare, uh, from when they were started, and to watch uh, a couple of decades of, of the uh, enterprise and web infrastructure automation software industry, um, which has been really fun. And what I want to talk to uh, you about today is how human a story this is, how deeply these tools reflect the characters of the people who wrote them, and how playful and funny and earnest this kind of software can be. And then I'm going to accelerate from history to science fiction and take a look at one potential future of automation and the DevOps movement because I believe that we, as a community, can harness the mighty power of laziness to do mighty things. There we go. The title of my talk is taken from T.H. White's book, The Once and Future King, and I didn't actually uh, coordinate this with John Esten from Ancestry.com. Um, but this is the other great fantasy novel not called Lord of the Rings uh, that was written in part as a response to uh, the World Wars. And you might know it from a really desperately bad Disney movie called The Sword in the Stone or an okay musical called Camelot or the pretty good song uh, Camelot from Monty Python's Holy Grail. But if that's the only place you've ever encountered it, I really encourage you to go and seek it out. It's, it's one of the great works uh, of science fiction and fantasy. And like The Lord of the Rings, it's about power, like the World Wars, for that matter. It's about what happens after the Industrial Revolution, and you get this unprecedented amount of power concentrated into just a few human hands. The question is, what do you do with it? And in The Once and Future King, this is actually formulated as the question of might versus right. Arthur puts together his round table, and he's got these knights, and they're very mighty, and they're really good at fighting. And Merlin says to him, well, just because you're able to win all the fights, does that mean that you're in the right? And Arthur says, of course it does. And he goes on and thinks about it for 40 years. Um, I'm making it sound really dreary. It's not. It's hilarious. It's uh, as if The Lord of the Rings had been written by Eric Idle or John Cleese. Um, for example, the character of Merlin actually starts old and gets younger over the course of the book. He lives in reverse, like uh, Benjamin Button Delio. 
And one of the consequences of that is that he remembers everything that's going to happen in the future very vividly. He's, he's down with the Don Bradman and, and actually the details of the Second World War. But everything that happens in the past comes as a complete shock. And it's my contention that the tech industry itself uh, shares this historical amnesia and intimacy with the details of the future. And so I'm going to give you a history lesson, but I'll, I'll try not to be boring about it. Because comedy is a core engineering value. Really good software works like a joke. It, uh, I, I realized this when I was trying to get a sense of the culture of computer science, which is a doomed endeavor, but well worth the time. Uh, and I discovered the amazing archive that the students of the great computer scientist Edgar Dijkstra have put together online. They've taken all of his beautifully handwritten lecture notes over a 30, 40 year career, and they've, they've put them into this web archive. And my favorite of the many, many treasures in that trove um, is Edgar Dijkstra's solution for solving really, really hard problems. He says, what you do is you sit down, you get a pen or a pencil, and you stare at a blank piece of paper for a really, really long time, and then you write down the answer. A good algorithm is like a good punchline. It's elegant and it's unexpected. It juxtaposes a couple of things that you don't usually think about in combination, or it subverts your expectations in some other way. The good joke about automation software, illustrated here by the great Randall Munro, is that although it's written by lazy people for lazy people, it takes an immense amount of fiddly, painstaking work to get it right. Douglas Adams, who, while not being a Python, wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is equally funny, uh, was unusually cogent on this topic. Like Stephen Fry, he was a, a hacker and a Mac enthusiast in his spare time. And in his book, Last Chance to See, he wrote that he was rarely happier than when spending an entire day programming my computer to perform automatically a task that it would otherwise take me a good 10 seconds to do by hand. 10 seconds, I tell myself, is 10 seconds. Time is valuable. And 10 seconds of it is well worth the investment of a day's happy activity, working out ways of saving it. Adams was inspired to write this by the Megapode pictured here. He described it as a lean and sprightly chicken. Uh, it's my fellow antipode, and this is actually an Australian brush turkey. He was talking about a Megapode that lived in the um, uh, islands of, of Indonesia, but they have the same labor-saving device, which was what caught Adam's attention. Rather than sitting on its eggs day in, day out, the Megapod has come up with this ingeniously simple workaround. All it does is it excavates a quarry three cubic feet in volume, fills it with rotting compost, lays its eggs on top, puts another six, feet, six cubic feet of rotting compost on top of that, and then spends all day adding and removing to the pile of rotting compost to keep the eggs at their optimum temperature. As you can see, this, this saves an enormous amount of effort. Uh, the volume numbers come from the piece of software that Douglas Adams wrote in order to calculate the volume of a megapode nest. Uh, he says this piece of software took him an hour to write, but he pointed out that it would save him infinite amounts of time should he need to calculate the volume of megapode nests in future. Whether such occasions did arise, history sadly doesn't relate. I think we can all recognize something of ourselves in both Adams and in his lean, sprightly chicken. It is remarkable how much effort we'll go to in order not to have to go to any particular effort. New things have to be brought into the world, but bringing them into the world is really hard work. Nevertheless, Bringing new things into the world is the core function of the tech industry. And the fact that we're in the middle of another hype bubble right now makes the once and future part of my title especially apt and, frankly, scary. Danny O'Brien, the great EFF actist, has taken to tweeting with the very Merlinish hashtag, all of this has happened and will happen again. So for the vast majority of you who won't recognize him under that glorious head of hair, this fresh-faced young fellow is Mark Andreessen, age 25. This was when I first met him. And I'm being unfair, because if you saw a picture of me at that age, it would be equally funny. The year is 1996, and Mark is most famous for founding Netscape Communications, which is a company that sells a web browser. It's a vastly more innocent time. 
So Netscape released the first version of Navigator in October of 1994 and went public 10 months later, as you do. On its first day of trading, it closed a whisker under 3 billion in market cap. And with Navigator installed, the web looked exactly the same, whether you were looking at it from a Windows or a Mac machine. And for the mid-90s, this was an unprecedented thing. And it's the reason that uh, Netscape was in Microsoft's crosshairs from day one. So Microsoft wrote its own browser, gave it away, built its own web server internet information server, and made it more secure than Netscape's version and five times faster. Uh, the evil genius behind this set of countermeasures was, of course, Paul, of course, Paul Moritz, um, who went on to become the CEO of VMware and is now running Pivotal Labs. And that should serve as a salutary reminder never to burn your bridges with anyone in tech, because we are a very small cast of characters, and everyone has to play more than one part. Anyway, with Microsoft on the warpath, Netscape had to find a new business model, and fast if it was going to survive. It decided to ship a cheap open alternative to Microsoft back office and call it Sweet Spot. And to do this, it bought Insic Re's web application server company, Kiva. The architect of this strategy was Ben Horowitz, who had actually only been at, Microsoft, uh, at Netscape for a little while when he started planning an all-singing, all-dancing Sweet Spot launch for March 1996. And you know what lo launches are like. They were trying to keep everything locked down, so it would be a big surprise and get a lot of press. Two weeks before the launch, Mark uh, had an interview with the Wall Street Journal and spilled the beans. So on the very day that this cover came out, with Mark sitting on a throne barefoot, he and Ben had a huge fight in email, which uh, culminated in Mark pointing out that Netscape hadn't released any news or indeed any signs of life in the last six months and had lost $3 billion in market cap. Mark finished the email by saying, next time, do the fucking interview yourself. The subtext of the email, which Ben, to his credit, received and understood, was, trust me. And in fact, Ben and Mark have been friends and business partners ever since. After many more adventures, Netscape was sold to AOL, where Ben and Insic became responsible for AOL's e-commerce platform. And the experience of building and scaling e-commerce sites for AOL's customers turned out to be so painful, they figured out there had to be a better way. And that's how they came up with the idea for the presciently named Loud Cloud. And these days, we'd call it a cloud, but back then, uh, Loud Cloud was something like a managed service provider and something like a web host. They launched it on 9999, four nines, get it? By the time it filed for its IPO in 2000, it had cost Mark some of his hair, and he was only the chairman. Ben was actually running the thing. I don't know if any of you remember 2001, but it was a bad time to be running a managed services business, or a services business, or a business. Most of LoudCloud's customers made drastic cuts to what they were spending with the company. Some of LoudCloud's customers, including its single biggest customer, went bankrupt. Things did not look good for our heroes. What Ben decided was to sell the managed services business to EDS and to pivot LoudCloud into a software company called Opsware, which would sell the automation they'd written to support the web hosting infrastructure. And while hindsight paints it as one of history's great pivots, because HP bought Opsware for $1.6 billion in 2007, it was far from obvious at the time that this was even a good idea. And the company's stock price immediately tanked. It went down to 35 cents a share. It was a penny stock. You probably know all of this. There are two interesting points that I want to make about it. One is that Opsware, after all, wasn't Mark and Ben's first pivot. That was turning Netscape into a back-end server software company. So they already knew what was involved in turning a battleship around. Um, lots of shouting and swearing, a leap of faith, a ton of hard work, even more good luck, and a chance at a better future. The other interesting thing is the kind of pivot they made. In the case of Opsware, Ben decided that the services business was best handed off to a services specialist, while he and his team doubled down on software. This services versus software argument is one the industry keeps having again and again and again. And I think there isn't a definitive answer. I think some customers sometimes want to buy services, and some companies sometimes want to buy software. And you kind of have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis and, and best guess. The question that can be answered is, what kind of team are you? And what kind of product do you want to sell? And in Ben and Mark and Insic's case, it was software. 
and in particular, software to make a really hard job easy, because that was the kind of software they had needed at AOL, and that addressed a real pain that they and others had felt. And that's part of what I mean when I say that this is a human story, and that hu tools reflect the characters of the people who create them. It's worth pointing out that the Opsquare code base itself had to be pivoted. It was never designed to be turned into a product. It was written to support loud cloud servers internally. And even EDS, when it took over the loud cloud part of the business, found the Opsquare software incredibly difficult to use and maintain. The company had to do a pretty substantial rewrite before it had a product it could bring to market. And it's to that rewrite that I attribute the loss of the rest of Mark's hair. The stakes were high. There was a ton of competition. Opsware did not happen in a vacuum. As you know, the company didn't invent configura configuration automation. Mark Burgess wrote the first version of CF Engine in 1993 and did a major rewrite in 98. Blade Logic was founded in 2001. The first release of Puppet showed up in 2005. Um, Chef actually postdates the sale of Opsware. And I could have called this talk the once and future Opsware, because Chef, in a lot of ways, is doing what Opsware tried to do but doing it right. And these are just some of the frameworks that are still around. There are lots and lots and lots of others, pretty much every variation on provisioning and configuration and runbook automation that you can imagine. Uh, the names were things like Aduva and Senarun and Concera and Creekpath and Ejacent and Enigmatic and iConclude and Jareva and Moonlight and Platespin and Rendition and TerraSpring and Think Dynamics. And I'm pretty sure I'm the only person who remembers all of them. And that's not even counting another generation that sprang up in the wake of VMware. So why is it Opsware that we remember? Um, the VC, uh, Fred Wilson from Flatiron, has called it the loud cloud Opsware miracle. And he said that Mark and Ben were the only people who could have pulled it off. Um, I think that's probably true. And I think the reason they did pull it off is that all of the founders of automation companies, and I did talk to all of them, Mark and Ben were the ones who took fullest advantage of what it is that automation lets you do. Automation lets companies pivot. It makes companies more adaptable to change. Why? Because when you script a process, when you write a chef recipe, for example, you do two things. One, you make it possible for a machine to reproduce that process in a completely standard way. That means it doesn't have to be done by hand anymore by the person who figured out how to do it. So it frees up that person's time to figure out how to do other things. And two, in doing so, you preserve the institutional knowledge that came up with that process in the first place. Remember Edsger Dijkstra's method for solving hard problems? You write down the answer on a piece of paper. Automation is a way of capturing the expertise of your experts. It's a library of best practices. It's a body of work. It's a culture. I'm indebted for a lot of this insight to Ben's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I saw Adam's been reading it as well. If you haven't read it yet, it's amazing. Uh, it shares a lot of Dijkstra's unflinching courage in staring at that blank page. The trouble is, and Ben talks about this, if you're trying to bring something genuinely new into the world, there is, by definition, no existing playbook that you can run. Coming up with the playbook, that itself is the hard thing. So I covered Opsware pretty closely. I, I thought I knew the company pretty well. But one of the surprises for me in reading Ben's book was that when he decided to sell out to Opsware in 2007, it was in part because he saw the writing on the wall. If he hadn't sold, he would have had to rebuild the product all over again. And that's because virtualization was be beginning to take off. There's no question that Opsware could have done it. We've seen yesterday and today how Chef can be re-architected to take advantage of Docker, and, and will do so. But it would have taken a year or two to pull it off with the kinds of software release they had then. And with 2020 hindsight, it's really clear that Ben didn't want to be trying to sell a company like that in 2008 or 2009. So the success of VMware had a huge influence on that decision, which is hardly so very surprising, because the success of VMware had a huge influence on a lot of things. It is funny now to think that we spent 20 odd years from the mid 70s to the mid 90s uh, believing that the x86 microprocessor couldn't be virtualized. It's got a number of um, 
sensitive but not privileged instructions, and thus it falls outside the computer science uh, classification of, of the software, uh, the, the chips that can be virtualized. But what Mendel Rosenblum figured out in the 1990s when he was teaching operating systems at Stanford is that the number of x86 instructions that behave badly in a virtual environment are finite, and the number of their interactions are finite. And that means you can write a software workaround. It takes a huge performance hit, but you can do it, and that's where VMware came from. And that is why, for the first five years of its life, it was dog slow. It, it took like a 40% performance hit off the top. And it didn't bother the coders at all, and they were just delighted to be able to sandbox environments on the development machine so that their buggy code didn't bring down their whole environment. But that 40% performance hit made VMware a non-starter in production environments for a long time. And when Diane Green first told me that she believed that all servers, development and production, were going to be virtualized, pains me to admit that I laughed at her. The only way that was ever going to happen was if Intel, Intel and AMD built hardware assistant to the chips themselves, which they proceeded to do in 2006. And that's why Diane looks so happy in 2007. Uh, the chips support the software workarounds in near real time. VMware went public on the strength of it. And these days, bare metal is for eccentric edge cases like Hadoop, and sometimes not even that. Watch this space. While virtualization was bad news for Opsware in particular, it was completely amazing news for automation in general. VMs and configuration automation go together like steel containers and cranes. And what you get when you deploy them together is a phenomenal distribution network that trends relentlessly up and to the right. Uh, building on seven years of new work, Amazon's Elastic Comp Compute Cloud was finally able to achieve what Loud Cloud had only ever promised. Werner Vogels is a funny guy, but my favorite joke of his uh, dates from um, a, services, a service provider conference we were both at in about 2007. And all the other services providers were saying, we don't care about Amazon, it's a bookstore. And uh, Werner said, look, I'm Dutch. Sure, it's a bookstore, but I'm selling cocaine out the back. So that was another imaginative pivot enabled by automation. And this was another one. Um, this is Katarina Fake. She was up in Canada while all this was happening, running Ludicorp, which is actually a lifestyle business. It was pretty cool. Uh, it made a game that you may remember called Game Never Ending. It was a kind of 2D second life. Uh, one of the features was a chat room where players could share and comment on one another's photos. And that feature grew into Flickr. And Game Never Ending was shelved to be resurrected as Glitch, to be shelved again. But in case you ever wondered, that's why Flickr files have the extension .gne. It stands for Game Never Ending. Now, while Flickr remains one of my favorite sites, I think the single most important thing that ever came out of it is a slide deck that was presented at Velocity in 2009. John Allspur and Paul Hammond essentially wrote the manifesto for the DevOps movement. I'm sure you've all read it. They were building on two decades of influences on the developer side of the equation, Scrum, Extreme, test-driven development, Agile. But there are three absolutely crucial things that show up for the first time in their talk. One, cooperation between developers and operations is what allows developers to deploy 10 times a day. In other words, this cooperation is what's essential to allowing organizations to adapt rapidly to change. Second, automated infrastructure is the number one tool for achieving cooperation between developers and operations. They literally say, if you do nothing else, do this. Third, and maybe most profoundly, they give equal weight to these six classes of software tools and these four aspects of culture. In fact, when they talk about culture aspect number one, respect, they literally say, if you do nothing else, do this. If automation is a way of writing down the way things are done, respect is a way of making sure that what gets written down is a good way of doing things. Automation captures ideas. Respect creates an environment where ideas can surface and develop and be chosen on their merits. This is the mechanism by which automation makes companies resilient and adaptable to change, able to survive extreme pivots. I think there's a parallel to, if, if you've ever done martial arts or any kind of physical sport in adulthood, you might have seen the quadrant that talks about moving from unconscious incompetence 
to conscious incompetence, where you're still really bad, but you know how bad you are, to conscious competence, where you can control your muscles in this complex activity, but you have to think about it really hard all the time, to unconscious competence, which is mastery, which is where your muscle memory takes over and you don't have to think about what you're doing anymore. You probably noticed that when you were learning to drive, if you can remember that. Automation is the process of figuring out problems and putting them into an organization's muscle memory. And all of this makes me think about what a company actually is. A company, and especially a tech company, isn't just a legal fiction with a tax haven in the Bahamas. It's not just one idea or one technology. If it were, the companies that pivot would turn into some kind of zombie ghost. And some of them do, but not all of them. No, a company is a group of companions. It's a set of minds that work better together than they would apart. It's what Ben and Mark and the others achieved that made Opsware special. In good companies, that set of relationships is predicated on respect and trust. And if you don't believe me, believe this guy, who pulled off another of history's greatest pivots in going from mailing DVDs around to the glory that is orange is the new black. The second season premieres on June 6th. Don't call me, I'll be busy. Reed Hastings attributes his pivot entirely to the next Flix culture. And when the Flickr guys devote 40% of their 78 slides to the culture question, Netflix's 126 slides are all culture all the time. This is the nut, jack, nut graph, but the whole thing is well worth your time. And if it doesn't quench your thirst, I highly recommend the Valve employee handbook as well. The two company cultures are very different, as is Flickr's, as is Amazon's, as is VMware's, as was Opsware's. And any of them can be really unpleasant for people for whom they don't click. But Netflix and Valve are at the forefront of a movement for companies to make their internal social contracts both explicit and a competitive differentiator in how they hire and in how they execute. It's DevOps writ large, if you will. How can everyone turn the stuff that's already been figured out into repeatable processes and free up everyone's time to solve new and harder problems? These new ways of defining the problem domain are building extraordinary new companies and generating unprecedented value. They're very, very powerful ideas. And this is why I framed this talk in a discussion of might versus right, because as well as having in your hands the tools that give companies the power to adapt to change, you have the tools that give companies the power to change the world. Now, what are you going to do? One thing that needs to happen pretty urgently, and that I know a lot of you are already working on, is that we need to reboot the enterprise, like yesterday. Here she is from the original series, bless her clunky lines, I used to watch it with my dad. And here she is today looking sharp. I want to be very clear that there was nothing wrong with the old enterprise. One of the big mistakes us webheads made in the 1990s was thinking that all of the old ways of doing things were wrong, and that all of the new ways of doing things were right. We forgot that we saw further because we were standing on the shoulders of giants. The great Nichelle Nichols is a case in point. Um, during the first season, she really wanted to leave the show and get back to Broadway. She was like her generation's Adina Menzel. It was the Reverend Martin Luther King who persuaded her to stay, and he did it because he said that Uhura was such an important role model for black women and girls, and she was. The black astronaut Mae Jemison and Whoopi Goldberg have both directly credited Nichelle Nichols with their inspiration. New Uhura is great, but she isn't better, she's different. The world has changed around her. One of the big mistakes the old guard made in the 1990s was in thinking that all of the new ways of doing things were wrong and the old ways were right. And it was that belief that let Craigslist eat the world's newspaper classified ads and hollow out 100-year-old broadsheets and topple the industry. In the midst of this current bubble, I'm encouraged by the recognition on both sides of the web enterprise divide that there's a huge information asymmetry that runs both ways. Enterprises know how to run gnarly, arcane, ancient backend infrastructure, the likes of which script kiddies have never imagined. And web people know how to run at scales which dwarf even the hugest of the gnarly old enterprises. There are seven ways in which enterprise IT is deliberately reinventing itself. I've taken these specific points from the brilliant CTO of a Fortune 500 shoe company, 
but I hear them over and over again. I talk to CIOs every week at banks, insurance companies, pharma giants, oil and gas, healthcare providers, consultancies, you name it. You yourselves have heard from GE and Target and Ancestry. To those of you in the web scale world, a lot of this will seem familiar stuff. I encourage you especially to remember that enterprises have as much to teach you about their particular areas of tech expertise as you have to teach them about scale. But my larger argument is that these are seven specific areas in which enterprises are now seeking to take the approaches and methodologies of the web world. And you as ChefConf attendees, and those of you watching from home, are uniquely qualified to help them with this. We've already touched on the agile revolution. Markets just can't wait 18 months for new software releases anymore. They can't even wait the six months required for what people are calling edge to fall. An enterprise that's trying to keep up with a fast changing market has to bring up new businesses to replace those that are plateauing off. It's just as interest in finding product market fit as the leanest of lean startups. And the only way is to test through enough hypotheses by deploying fast, failing early, and failing often. If you want a perfect example of this, look at Microsoft right now. Microsoft is a beast. It's pulling down something like $80 billion in Windows Server revenue. But the writing's on the wall. Everybody knows that that revenue is plateauing off and beginning to decline. Sacha's job, and I don't envy him, but he's doing it really well so far, is to identify tiny little businesses within Microsoft that can spin up rapidly enough to gradually replace that trust fund over time. And that dynamic exists in every single industry and in every single enterprise. By the time a company gets big enough to be called an enterprise, it is by definition subject to the innovator's dilemma and hopefully has a critical mass of people who've actually read the innovator's dilemma. Enterprises get big by selling a product at a price point, and as soon as they get to that scale, startups glom onto them like remoras and undercut their prices. Paranoid enterprises cling to their revenue models and avoid cannibalizing their existing businesses, but a healthy enterprise is continually searching for these high-growth opportunities that can replace their existing businesses. It is scary, brave work, but it's very necessary. And it goes some way towards explaining this, the need to move from disaster recovery to disaster indifference. In the old world, enterprises were worried about an earthquake or a hurricane that would take out a data center and take their business down. What they were worried about was conceived of as an isolated event. Today, they feel like they're in a perpetual hurricane. The earth just never stops quaking. There's always something. Instead of contingency plans, they need something more like a fatalistic cheerfulness, an ability to laugh at imminent death. I've spent a lot of time with you battle-scarred veterans of large web deployments, and I've noticed that this is an especially marked quality of yours. See if you can fi figure out how to productize that. Open source is a super interesting one. It took us pundits a long, long time to persuade enterprise IT that their proprietary software was not necessarily their friend, and that the software for which they'd paid millions of dollars was not, therefore, superior to software which they believed had been thrown together by a couple of hobbyists in a backyard shed. Part of the difficulty here was that the Oracle account rep was so very good at obtaining tickets to football games. But part of it is the gnarliness of those enterprise backends. Enterprises don't just want native integration with their existing directory servers, identity and access management, monitoring, performance management, analytics, archiving, storage, compliance, governance, because those things are nice to have. They need them in order to extract the maximum possible value from these sunk capital costs. And building all of those hooks takes time. But in 2004, 2014, enough open source alternatives have gotten good enough for the 80% of use cases, and the proprietary software vendors have overreached far enough on price. And not to pick on Oracle here, Microsoft and SAP and VMware have all done this as well, and so have plenty of others. That the old objections to open source on principle have eroded from within. And similarly with the, remark the, the arguments for open premise versus SaaS. On-premise isn't going to go away, if only because nothing in IT ever really goes away. It just gets encapsulated and hidden behind another abstraction layer. It's going to be a hybrid world. But all other things being equal, for pretty much all the non-mission critical functions, and even for a few that are, if you can get a partner to host the software for you and have them worry about the patches and updates and provide adequate performance and support, you just will. Loud Cloud has finally won some 10 years after its demise. Exactly the same trade-off applies to the private infrastructure versus public cloud debate. The banks that are running their general ledgers on IBM mainframes aren't going to move those in the foreseeable future. 
But there's no reason to run a credit card loyalty campaign on hardware that expensive when you can rent cloud server capacity for it, or better still, have your marketing agency do it for you. Enterprises want to reach their employees and their customers, and those people are spending less time in front of their desktops and more time staring into tablets and phones. Android has replaced Windows as the developer's platform of choice. It started two years ago. It's done now. And weirdly, it's around this issue of the endpoint device that enterprises are beginning to most closely resemble their web-facing brethren. A Fortune 100 company these days is only nominally a shoe or a soft drink company or what have you. By the time a company reaches that kind of scale, it's typically a combination of a brand, design, marketing, distribution, and finance. Mobile apps support employees in design, marketing, and distribution, and they attract and endear customers to the brand. Starbucks estimates that it made a billion dollars off its mobile app last year. And that, in a nutshell, is why enterprises are DevOpsing like it's going out of style. It's because, like the web companies that DevOpsed before them, they're going to live and die on the quality of their data and their apps. And to write good modern apps, apps that pull data out of enterprise repositories and apps that feed data back into them, you can't be spending 18 months on a client server at least. You must have services that are exposed through clean APIs. The apps will come and go as the business changes. Apps will be written and rewritten, deployed and redeployed. Enterprise IT has literally no more important function than to support the creation of these apps, linking end users to information. And mobile is just the first generation. We're in prehistory here. There's going to be a deluge beyond mobile of the Internet of Things. It really is going to happen. It's already happening, whether you call it the industrial internet or what have you. The, the effort that you put into building clean APIs and clean interfaces today will repay itself a thousand times over when those back ends are serving orders of magnitude more devices. So all the enterprises I know of are reimagining themselves as software and information companies. Great software and information companies get to be that way by getting as many diverse, smart people together in a room as they possibly can, by fostering a culture of respect and trust and capturing the ideas they come up with as processes that can be automated. Automation is the foundational technology, not just for cooperation between development and operations, but for cooperation between practically every role in a modern organization and for cooperation between organizations. Therefore, although it may not feel like it, by virtue of being in this room, or in the virtual space around us, you are in a position of enormous power and influence. You're helping to create the future. What kind of future would you like it to be? Who would you like to see included in it? Whose ideas are important? And whose are being overlooked? Why? You will be astonished at how the choices you make today about what kind of software you want to write and what kind of company you want yours to be will reverberate down the whole length of your career. Thank you so much for your patience. I know I'm standing between you and lunch. I will send you off with two final quotes. One is from Sun's Brian Cantrell, who said recently that empathy is also a core engineering value. Brian and I disagree about a lot of things, but I think he's right about that. And the other is this one from the Scottish science fiction writer Alastair Gray. We don't really know what the future will bring. But one thing we can be sure of is that we'll, it will have its roots in the way we act today. So go ahead and work as if you lived in the early days of a better nation. Thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for lunch. Enjoy your lunch. The breakouts are going to start again at 1.20.